So we spent two days, this is with uh, me and, and, and Dr. King, who's the head of the lab. I'm showing him some of the things that we had found on prints that we had ordered from uh, LRL, from the Lunar and Planetary Lab, from Houston, and from his own shop there at the NSSDC. And um, he was very impressed and did absolutely nothing. In fact, a set of negatives we were specifically looking for from Apollo 10 between the first day and the second day, they had to admit to us that they had disappeared. Someone yanked those negatives so I could not confirm what I had been able to order through prints in previous months. So someone was looking at us following this trail even then, which was what, 12 years ago? As part of this sojourn, we showed them this print, we showed them this amazing, look at the regular vertical and horizontal bracing. That will come in, into importance later. We did find, years later, on the web, as NASA has begun to scan, as people in NASA have begun to scan what they claim are source data from the original copies of the film that have been preserved, that Ken was not to destroy, but to put into the freezers. Literally, the film has to be frozen to keep it from changing. They have been scanning and putting on the web modern versions of the same Apollo 14 photography. So we got hold a few months ago of one of these scan versions. This is the same, the same frame. Let me, let me go back one, all right? This is frame uh, 9301 from Ken. This is 9301 from NASA. And this, if I'm right, is a comparison. And you'll notice that this is a much lower generation, this is, or higher generation rather. This has been copied and copied and copied. The detail is all lost, but the main layering, the main glass tower, which you can see in the background, is still there. So when I said in our press releases before this briefing that we can now confirm from NASA data on official NASA websites what is there, I was not kidding. It is confirmed. Now, what I'm hoping to do through whatever you write, whatever Congress decides to do, whatever the American people decide to do, I'm hoping to pressure the system so we get access to the original data and we have that original data taken from the freezers and scanned with modern scanner technology at the best resolution available. And if we can get that ha to happen, and if you can track that process, kind of like a legal chain of custody, so we don't allow them to substitute fake film for the real film, I have no doubt now that we will confirm everything that Dr. Johnston has reported and then some because there are confirmed duplicates now on the web on NASA sites of what Ken preserved uh, 40 years ago. This is another frame. This I found just a few months ago. Uh, Alan Shepard, if you, if you go back and look, he was standing to the front of the limb when he took this picture with Mitchell. He scanned from the hard copy print, which he loaned me back in 1995 when we first met, and I had access to his archive in his home apart from a lot more film that he sent to the university or took to the university uh, up in, uh, in Oklahoma City. Um, this print alone blew my mind because it confirmed from untouched original source data preserved from low-level generational copies of the film. With film, which are analog mechanisms, the more copies you make, the worse the quality gets. A copy of a copy of a copy of a copy is awful. With digital, a copy of a copy of a copy is exactly the same because it's binary. It's ones and zeros, ones and zeros, and they can't pass up ones and zeros. However, with film, you want the lowest generation possible to make prints, to make transparencies, to make something that you can look at and analyze. And fortunately, Ken had the most pristine, lowest generational number version of this data that we know of anywhere on the planet right now. So I, when he gave me these prints, I took them back, 1995 now. Think of the scanner technology then compared to now. And we scanned the film, and we discovered something absolutely extraordinary. I mean, mind-blowing extraordinary. This is a close-up. We see the hills. We see just hints that something is not quite right in the sky. And when you scan it and simply turn up the gain, turn up the brightness, there, all over the sky, is a stunning set of geometry, glass-like 
semi-transparent scattering geometry, scattering blue light, which tells us that it must be fine particles, fine stuff, very micron size, with various imperfections, holes, sparkles, the whole nine yards. This is what can caught them painting out in the LRL, because everyone knows you can't see stars from the moon. The bright things were not stars. They were shining bits of glass scattering sunlight recorded by these primitive, by today's standards, Hasselblad cameras on 35 millimeter ectochrome film. Now, it was a special ectochrome. We don't have time this morning to get into all that story that NASA actually secretly developed a special film to go to the moon. That's a whole other saga, and there's gonna be more chapters in this saga, so we may invite you back in the next few weeks or months and do a part two, because this is a huge story and we can't do justice in an hour, hour and a half or whatever. Starting with this image, we then did sectionals, and we found that as you zoomed in, you got more and more detail in this supposedly black sky above the moon. Remember, it's a vacuum, no atmosphere. There should be nothing here. It should be pitch black. That, again, is why they were painting it out. This all fits together awfully, awfully well, and I use the term awfully with full knowledge. If you look carefully at this section, you'll see now that there is a stunning three-dimensional girder-like geometry, a scaffolding, rebar, a structural matrix standing above the moon anchored to the surface by a set of slanted buttresses. The geometry is perfect meaning it absolutely is consistent with what constructional techniques would be there if you had built something miles high above the current surface of the moon. If you look in close up, you'll see in the buttresses there are layers of detail. This again is what to me stunning, amazing, stunning quality because we had not had access to anything approaching this low generation from the Apollo negatives. In ordering all our stuff through the National Space Science Data Center, through Johnson in, in Houston, through the Lunar Planetary Laboratory, which is one of the Johnson affiliates, we had looked at things that were hinting that this kind of detail was there. But Ken Johnston was an incredible ray of sunshine because here he had 30-year-old, perfectly preserved, low-generation copies of NASA's priceless original film. And all over this film, we saw astonishing evidence of architecture on the moon that did not belong there. The reason I have a close-up now of a helmet is because each astronaut wore a gold visor, a gold-covered faceplate over the Lexon faceplate of the space helmet, which kept the air in and kept the astronaut from dying from explosive decompression. All these years, we have been told by NASA that, oh, this faceplate is designed to protect them from sunburn, from ultraviolet, from being burned. Well, I, along with everybody else, took NASA's word and never did my homework. When we got into this, when I started looking at how, how was NASA set up to know what they were going to photograph, how, if you're an astronaut in a spacesuit, do you know where to click the camera with your body to show the ruins? You've got to be able to see them to take the picture of what's there. So when I ran the curves, it turned out that based on this panorama, which is, by the way, the frame I'm talking about, uh, 9301, is this one right here, um, you've got this wavelength dependence of the human vision, you put the helmet on, and lo and behold, the helmet suppressed all of the spectrum, except for the blue-violet part, which is 20 times brighter now, which means NASA outfitted every astronaut who walked on the moon with a helmet with a glass film over it, which allowed them to see the ruins with the unaided human eye and take pictures of what was there. And all these years, they have been lying to us about the reason for the gold-covered helmets. When you enhance the panorama, Ken actually had an 8x10, which was a composite in the lab of all of the individual frames that Shepard took. Click, 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 click. If you look at the entire sky above the lunar landscape, there were stunning ruins all over the horizon, 360 around. This is the shadow of Shepard, all right? We brightened this up. 
The ruins are blue, they're scattering blue light, kind of similar to why the sky is blue on Earth because it's, it's fine particle scattering. It's not uniform, however. You can see that as you pan around the horizon in 360, it changes with azimuth. In other words, if you look at this set of stuff, this crud in the sky, it somehow knows where the sun is. The scattering is dependent on sun angle, which something simply, some imperfection with the film, you know, or some bad chemistry, or something that went wrong in the lab, would have no way of knowing. This panorama shows clearly that the scattering is dependent on sun angle. It is brightest down sun, which means it's acting like, like, like a movie screen. It's scattering the sun light through the ruins back at you, and that's why it's brightest where the shadow is of Shepard pointing away from the sun. Everything about this scattering is consistent with it being a real physical set of lunar ruins extending miles above the moon, made of meteor-battered, smashed glass over countless millions of years. Real good, right down the line. Oh man, we're level with the top of the massif now. Okay, stand by for pitch over. Oh, are we coming in? Pitch over, proceeded. And there it is, Houston, there's Camelot. Wow. Wow. Target, I see it. We got them all. 42 degrees, 37 degrees, to 5,500. 53 degrees. Okay, I've got Barre, I've got Poppy, I've got the triangle. That's Five hundred feet, fifty-two degrees. H dot is good. At two thousand, there it is. Proceeded. And there it is, Houston. There's Camelot. Wow. Target. Forty-five hundred feet, fifty-two degrees. We got them all. Forty-two degrees, thirty-seven degrees, two fifty-five hundred. Fifty-three degrees. Okay, I've got Barre. I've got Poppy. I've got the triangle. That's 2,500 feet, 52 degrees. H dot is good, 2,000, H dot is good. Fuel is good. One down at 10, cut the H dot. The fuel's good. 110 feet, stand by for some dust. Little forward, G. Little forward a little. 90 feet. Little forward velocity. 80 feet. Going down at three. Okay. He's running about 1,400 BTU. Oh, okay. okay. Are you ready? Going down about two. Very little down. All set. Very little. 125 high range. Okay. Okay. You saw what difficulties I was having. I'll try to watch your cliffs uh, from underneath here. Thank you. 
not uh, very powdery surface, but uh, Again, please, Buzz, you're cutting out. And uh, just again, please, Buzz. I say that the rocks are rather slippery. So I just got a very powdery surface uh, when it's on there. So I fill up all the uh, very little fine porous.
Dave, do you see Spurs? You look up there? The traders in that one directly ahead. Spurs, you look up there? Oh, yeah, I see what you mean, Dave. You see that? Yeah, there are, let's see, one, two, three, four, at least four lined up going uh, up slope. Yeah, right on the wall of the crater. Yeah. Just perfectly linear and perfectly uniform craters, little ones, maybe. Yeah, but look, there's a, a rock just below those. I wonder if it could have bounced. <laughs> no, <laughs> I couldn't have made that many. And we're going at the base of the front, we're going down into a little uh, depression that runs along the front. We came over another north south trending ridge. And uh, we're going down a little bit, and then we're going to start up again. We have to think, see what happens to rover speed here as we start up slope. Yeah, because we are starting up slope. I'd estimate uh, three to five degrees. Yep, okay, gonna take a little lead to the left here. Oh, that, those weren't very big holes at all, were they? Just a shadow made them look. Dave and Jim, what was the bearing on that chain of craters you described? Hey, Joe. Joe, it was just a very subtle little maybe half foot craters in the size of a four meter crater uh, that showed up very well in the shadow. And okay. That was just at our 348 for 4.3 okay. where we are right now. And uh, we stopped, and let's take a gander around and see which way we got ahead. You know, uh, Dave, if we could make it out that far directly ahead of us, look at the large blocks. You mean it come down slope? Yeah, at 12 o'clock. No, the antenna's in my way. Okay, that's that's as good a way as any. We'll hit uh, 140 from here. We would give a fair amount of visible light. Hey, I just saw a flash on the lunar surface. Oh, yeah? Uh, it was just right out there north of Grimaldi. Just north of Grimaldi. You might see if you got anything on your seismometers. Although uh, a small impact probably would give a fair amount of visible light. Okay, well, Jack. It was a bright little flash right out there near that crater. Uh, see the crater right at the edge of Grimaldi? Then there's another one north of it. Fairly sharp one north of it is where uh, there was just a thin prick of, of light. Copy that. Hey, I guess it's better work that. It really is cool. Hey! Wait a minute. What? Where are the reflections? I've been fooled once. There is orange soil. Well, don't move it till I see it. It's all over. Orange. Don't move it till I see it. I've stirred it up with my feet. Hey, it is! I can see it from here. It's orange. Wait, let me put my visor up. It's still orange. Sure it is. Crazy. Orange. I've got to dig a trench, Houston. I'll uh, copy that. Hey, I guess it's better work fast. It really is. Same color as these. The temperature on the set is about 100 and... Uh, Temperature on a set is about 102. It's almost the same color as the LMP decal on my camera. Fantastic, sports fans. It's trench time and market. Copy that. You got 367, you want to pick up the camera just before I hit a board stage. Camera's not going to run without me holding it. The average D, 20 seconds. Ah, shoot. 
Okay, okay let's get off. Forget the camera. Okay, Ten seconds. Second. Ten seconds. Four Four stage. stage pushed. Engine arm is at Okay, I'm going to get the pro. 99, proceeded. Three, two, one. Ignition. Run right away, Houston. Backs are good. Back side. Take over. Uh, up in, uh, in Oklahoma City. Um, this print alone blew my mind because it confirmed from untouched original source data preserved from low level generational copies of the film. With film, which are analog mechanisms, the more copies you make, the worse the quality gets. A copy of a copy of a copy of a copy is awful. With digital, a copy of a copy of a copy is exactly the same because it's binary. It's ones and zeros, ones and zeros, and they can't pass up ones and zeros. However, with film, you want the lowest generation possible to make prints, to make transparencies, to make something that you can look at and analyze. And fortunately, Ken had the most pristine, lowest generational number version of this data that we know of anywhere on the planet right now. So I, when he gave me these prints, I took them back, 1995 now, 12 years ago. As part of this sojourn, we showed them this print, we showed them this amazing, look at the regular vertical and horizontal bracing. That will come in, into importance later. We did find, years later, on the web, as NASA has begun to scan, as people in NASA have begun to scan what they claim are source data from the original copies of the film that have been preserved, that Ken was not to destroy, but to put into the freezers. Literally, the film has to be frozen to keep it from changing. They have been scanning and putting on the web modern versions of the same Apollo 14 photography. So we got hold a few months ago of one of these scan versions. This is the same, the same frame. Let me, let me go back one, all right? This is frame uh, 9301 from Ken. This is 9301 from NASA. So we spent two days, this is with uh, me and, and, and Dr. King, who's the head of the lab. I'm showing him some of the things that we had found on prints that we had ordered from uh, LRL, from the Lunar and Planetary Lab, from Houston, and from his own shop there at the NSSDC. And um, he was very impressed and did absolutely nothing. In fact, a set of negatives we were specifically looking for from Apollo 10 between the first day and the second day, they had to admit to us that they had disappeared. Someone yanked those negatives so I could not confirm what I had been able to order through prints in previous months. So someone was looking at us following this trail even then, which was what? Solution available, and if we can get that ha to happen, and if you can track that process, kind of like a legal chain of custody, so we don't allow them to substitute fake film for the real film, I have no doubt now that we will confirm everything that Dr. Johnston has reported, and then some because there are confirmed duplicates now on the web, on NASA sites, of what Ken preserved uh, 40 years ago. This is another frame. This I found just a few months ago. Uh, Alan Shepard, if you, if you go back and look, he was standing to the front of the limb when he took this picture with Mitchell. He scanned from the hard copy print, which he loaned me back in 1995 when we first met, and I had access to his archive in his home apart from a lot more film that he sent to the university or took to the university. And this, if I'm right, is a comparison. And you'll notice that this is a much lower generation, this is, or higher generation rather. This has been copied and copied and copied. The detail is all lost, but the main layering, the main glass tower, which you can see in the background, is still there. So when I said in our press releases before this briefing that we can now confirm from NASA data on official NASA websites what is there, I was not kidding. It is confirmed. Now, what I'm hoping to do through whatever you write, 
whatever Congress decides to do, whatever the American people decide to do, I'm hoping to pressure the system so we get access to the original data. And we have that original data taken from the freezers and scanned with modern scanner technology at the best resolution.